This is the recording for the Unit 1 practice test. And we're going to start out with vectors. And just a side note, we're going to do very little about and with vectors during this class. So this is about the only time that you see it here on this practice test on a non-proctored exam. Respectively, there will be one lab where we're going to deal with them, but as I said, very little we're going to do with it especially virtually no calculations. Anyway, this is the only time that you will see it. So vectors. Direction can be defined in terms of... What is a vector? can be defined in terms of north, east, south, west, left, right, forward, backward, up, down. For which of the following does it make sense to include direction? And then I give an example here, a couple of examples, where I'm saying, okay, so Homer is 10 miles due south of Anchor Point. You definitely can see that, can say that. And I can also say, I punch with a force of 50 pounds to the right where the annoying guy is standing. Um, but what I cannot say is that it is 3 p.m. towards the left. Or, as I was hiking last weekend, it was 73 degrees Fahrenheit towards the east. I just cannot say that. They don't have a direction. Certain measurements do have a direction. Certain others don't. So, temperature and time do not, velocity does, speed, yeah, we can say I'm driving 50 miles per hour, but we can also say I'm driving 50 miles per hour towards the west, displacement. Yeah, distance with direction, I can say I drove for 40 miles, but I can also say I drove 40 miles north. Force, as I just explained in pounds, the same thing happens in newtons. Okay, scalars are numbers, measurements, where you cannot attach a direction to it. You cannot attach it to time or temperature, you cannot attach it to mass. My mass is 90 kilograms. Somebody could say, well, it's 90 kilograms down because Earth attracts me with its gravitation, but actually what Earth attracts me is the mass times gravity, so which means the force that it exerts. So my weight is 200 pounds down, but my mass is 90 kilograms, no matter where I am, and there is no direction attached to it. And of course, acceleration and velocity themselves are vectors. They have a direction. You can say on acceleration that I'm accelerating forward or I'm accelerating backwards. I know in everyday language we call it deceleration, and physics we just call it either way acceleration. We can also accelerate sideways, in which we're gonna we're turning. All right. You may have already noticed that this recording is going to take quite a while because I'm want to do go. I want to go into detail on on this one here. So obeying significant figures. This is one thing that I'm going to hit you over the head with all semester long significant figures that you have to pay attention to them as you make measurements as you compute because I just don't want to see numbers that are eight digits long where they shouldn't be. There should be two or three digits long, or estimates should be one digit long. In fact, this is what this problem is about. We are using them already in everyday language. Look at the first example here. The wife, who is in a hurry to pick up the kids, calls the husband who, wants to, who went to the bank that day about how much money do we have in our checking account. Notice that she's saying about right there about how much money we have now remember she's also in a hurry so the husband who pulls over so he could search for the receipt which takes him 13 minutes 21.3 seconds total overkill right apparently it takes him more than 10 minutes he says about we have about four thousand three hundred twenty one dollars and eighty nine cents in our checking account he uses the word about in the wrong context that's not about that's an exact number but that's not what she wanted to know she says therefore I didn't catch the thousand dollar digit because it took you so long and I'm in a hurry and I just wanted to know that because we're renovating our home and you know but I'm glad that we have 89 cents in there the whole thing just doesn't make sense she said about we use significant figures okay so here's the opposite way husband now he's in a hurry to pick up the kids, so calls the wife who went to the bank that day about how much money do we have in our checking account again. The word there's the word about. The wife says, after contemplating for just one second, we have about four thousand dollars in our checking account. She just went to the bank, she knows it. 
The husband says, thanks, that's all I needed to know in order to make an estimate for our home remodeling. There you go. We are using these for the estimates. For a recipe, recipe for a potato salad says 5.25 large potatoes, 2.7 ribs of celery, and so on. Well, 0.654 large onion, I mean, how do we define a large onion? That's an estimate to begin with. So we are just using for these kinds of estimates just one significant figure. In fact, somebody could say, hey, one half, that sounds like two, but no, it's not. It's one half, one over two. Both of them are have one significant figure, 0.5. Three ribs of celery, five large potatoes. So, oh, yeah, that one should be checked correctly. All right, on the day after the 2014 elections, they reported that Bill Walker had won the Alaska gubernatorial election with 48.1%, while the incumbent governor, Sean Parnell, had gotten 45.9% of the vote. Here, it makes sense to do three significant figures, because, you know, is it 48 versus 46? Well, both of them would be rounded, and then we don't know how close it is, so it makes sense to do three significant figures. Now, when they're being recorded at the Alaska State, Alaska Division of Elections, they must record the exact number of votes. So notice that this one here says that Walker got 134,658 votes, which is six significant figures. They have to record it that way, so the percentage would also have to be six significant figures, 48.0994. Parnell got 128,435 votes. That's a percentage of 45.8765. So here, it really needs to be recorded that accurately because that's what they require. In the 2000 United States presidential election in Florida, George W. Bush received 2,912,790 votes, while Vice President Al Gore received 2 million nine hundred twelve thousand two hundred fifty three votes notice how close these are they have to go to the fifth significant figure in order to actually see a difference in fact when they're recorded they probably should go to perhaps even six significant figures to even show more how how that one is um, how close that one is six or seven even and notice if you say this on the radio you actually have to go all the way out to five significant figures to actually show a difference for these two. So again, this one here makes all sense. So all the ones that I checked make sense. All right, let's move on. More on significant figures. Northernmost town in Germany is Flensburg. Southernmost town is Konstanz. The driving distance between the two towns is 835 kilometers. The mileage is, well, if when I compute that, so 835 divided by 1.6 miles, I'm sorry, kilometers to the, to the mile, comes out to this number here, total, over, total overkill, because notice I divided by two sig fig. Here I have three sig fig. So the answer must adhere to the, or must obey, the smallest number of significant figures, which is two. So this should be rounded to 520 miles. Now, I don't know if somebody else may actually use a more accurate conversion, which is 1.609 kilometers to the mile. Notice that the number come, that comes up with is a little bit different, but again, total overkill of significant figures. So we go with the rule of use the smallest amount of sig fig. So here are three, here are four, therefore go with three significant figures, so it's 519. So on this one here, two significant figures, 520. On this one here, three significant figures, 519, and that's also why you see two different answers here depending on which conversion unit a student uses on this one here. These here, yes, this is what the calculator shows, but it's just ridiculous that 0.95587 miles there at the end, there is no meaning to it. Okay. By the way, um, the population apparently didn't figure in here at all. That was just a red herring. A ball rolls along a level surface starting with velocity of 53 meters per second. Friction reduces the ball to velocity of 36 meters per second in 3.7 seconds. This is pretty much a giveaway that the answer needs to be two significant figures. And when you do that calculation, you come up with an acceleration of negative 4.6 meters per second squared. The negative is there because it slowed down to indicate, yes, it did get slower. 
So I'm going to choose that answer. This is what the calculator shows, by the way. But again, it's it's an overkill. And in fact, if you have that many digits listed here or this one here, you're losing track of what's important. What really is important is that it's around 500 miles. Because if you really drive that distance, you're not interested in what, you know, the last few feet here. You're really interested in that you're going at least 500 miles. All right, a non-stop 6,400 kilometer long flight from Anchorage to Beijing took 8.5 hours the airplane's average speed is well again two significant figures and when you do that you come up with 750 kilometers per hour okay the zero is what is tripping people so 2.0 liter bottle means that we have two significant figures it's not 1.8 rounded to 2 or 2.2 rounded down to 2 it is 2.0 it could be 1.9 7 rounded to 2.0 that could be but this one here indicates that it is two significant figures it's that accurate when that one is converted to milliliters we seemingly actually lose some accuracy here we have to keep in mind that the original number was already two sig fig so 2.0 liters which becomes 2000 milliliters we have to keep in mind actually that the first zero and the two, of course, are significant, while the other two here are placeholders. I know that's a little hard or complicated, but unfortunately, that's what happens with the zeros. I don't like it either. It's just what happens with it, um, which is also 2,000 grams. And again, carrying the two significant figures from the original one still means that the 2,000 grams here is the first two and the zero are significant and the other two are placeholders. How many ounces is that? Well, I'm going to do that. Let's see. Do I get two? Oh, yeah, I do get two different answers. Hold on. I had to recall in my mind what the conversion is. So I'm going to do 2,000 divided by 28.3 grams to the ounce, 70.67. Because, again, I have two sig fig over here. This one is actually 71 ounces. But remember, this is actually volume where... A different kind of conversion applies which is 29.7 fluid ounces I didn't look that up now I just recall it from memory maybe I got the right one and now I have still two significant figures and I'm going to come up with two sig fig so 67 okay maybe I did look up the wrong one hold on I did look it up it's actually 29.6 so let's try that Round it. There we go, 67.56, which is rounded to 68 again, two sig fig. So I come out with two different results, 71 and 68, which is why I have listed here two different answers depending for this one here, depending on which one you use. If you use the ounces, which is a mass or a weight unit, in this case, mass and weight shouldn't be confused, but unfortunately, sometimes we do that in everyday language. Or if you use the volume unit which is the fluid ounces and again a little bit confusion here in the american system because the ounces was already reserved for weight all of a sudden it's a volume anyway we're not doing a whole lot of conversions from metric to american system and and vice versa because this one is going to be based on the metric system when i do teach i actually quite frequently do make a conversion because it makes more sense to American students to hear it in pounds or feet or ounces or miles per hour and so on. But of course, all the calculations will be in metric and all the results will be in metric. All right, compute the area of a circular center pivot irrigation field with this radius. Use pi as supplied on the calculator, then use a crudely rounded 3.1, not 3.14, but 3.1. Oh well, so. Uh, let's see, 412 pi r squared. I'm going to use the pi here. Oops, that was not the pi. I used the pi, there it is, times 412.6 squared. And that one should be four significant figures, so 534,800 would be the answer. Or I use a crudely rounded 3.1, also times 412.6 squared. 
This time around, it's two significant figures, so this one here should be 530,000 square meters. And let's see, these, these are the two possible answers. And if you recall what I just typed in the calculator, you can see that that indeed should be the answers around to the correct significant figures. A large steel cuboid, cuboid is, simply means something that's rectangular in three dimensions, has these dimensions, 5.00 and so on. Um, apparently the cuboid was cut to very exact dimensions, so, it, so it's not 4.9 rounded to 5, no, no, it really is 5.00 centimeters. Its mass was measured on a balance to the closest gram, so it happens to be 1,600 grams, not a gram more or less, so it really is 1,600 grams, four significant figures. Each one of these, you have three significant figures, so the answer must be three significant figures. Now, when you type that on the calculator, interesting thing is happening. As you do the volume, I'm going to clear this out here. As you do the volume, 5.00 times 5.00 times 8.00, there you go, 200, okay, and now you take 1600, whoops, not the, not times, but divide by the volume of 200, you come up with a nice 8, one significant figure, but that's not true, because it said that all of these here are three significant figures, this is four, so the result must be three significant figures, so it is actually 8.00 grams per cubic centimeter. The point zero zero here indicates it was that accurate. It's not eight. That really sounds like it's crudely rounded, which it's not. The, the measurements were much more accurate than that, so it has to reflect the three significant figures. So I'm going to choose that answer. All right. Wow, 17 minutes here, and I got the first four done. I should perhaps try to accelerate that a little bit. Accelerate, by the way, does have a direction. I don't know about, in this case, time, I guess, forward in time. Which of these several are base units in the metric system? You would have to Google them, so I'm just going to give them away. Meters, kilograms, and seconds is what you will find in the first, oh, 10, 14 chapters even in this book. These are all the base units. All the other units that we come across are derived. So, for example, the meters per second is obviously derived. The newton is actually also derived. It's kilograms, meters per second squared. So is the joule kilograms meters squared per second squared. So all the units that we find in the first 12, 14 chapters, I believe, are actually based on meters, kilograms, and seconds. All the others are derived from that. In the next couple of chapters, or I think actually four chapters, 15 through 18, we will find there is a new one of Kelvin for the temperature and the mole for the amount of a substance. And towards the end, last couple of chapters, we will come across the ampere or amp for electric current and this one we're not going to come across, but it's still a base unit, the candle. Again, everything else is derived. All right, this one here is only a one-time thing to convert here. I, I'm sorry not to converge, but match these metric units with the corresponding U.S. customary units. I said earlier American units, but either way, Americans are basically the only ones who are still using the outdated British customary units. Um, there is a reason why we use the metric system because it is so simple. All you have to do is con um, shift the decimal point. There are no strange conversion units in there. And I'm saying conversion units. Yes, we, we do have strange constants, but we have them in either system. But we have a nice 1,000 meter to the kilometer, nice 100 centimeters to the meter we don't have the strange 5280 feet in a mile or 12 inches in a foot and people argue well there are advantages of having 12 inches in, in a foot and i'm saying no not really being in a decimal system it is really nice to base it on the 10. all right anyway so meters the, con the matching unit is the foot. I know that one foot is not one meter, but that's not what I'm asking here. So I'm just trying to match, match these up here. So the meter and the foot are the corresponding units. 
so therefore the meters per second is also matched with the foot foot feet per second and oops I meant to choose this one here the seconds is the seconds actually in both of them the Newtons which is a measurement a unit for force and weight in the American system it's the pound there we go the joules I actually had a tough time finding that one it's the BTU British thermal unit there really isn't a base unit in the American system there should be because it's energy it's so important but there are so many different ones used in the metric it's definitely the joules yes occasionally we do use the kilowatt hour but it's not quite metric itself because of the hour in there okay and then the last one missing here is the kilogram and yes do google it you will find it in the American system the base unit for or the standard unit for mass is the slug sounds like the animal but it really is pounds itself is a weight not to be confused with a mass all right which of the several are correct one meter is longer than one foot one kilogram is more than one pound mass we have an alternative unit in the American system or you do which is the pound mass um, the slug is actually pretty huge it's actually 16 kilograms so this one is true one inch is longer than one centimeter to 2.54 centimeters to the inch and one mile is longer than one kilometer and I think these are the four that are in there all right Alaska has an area of 1,700,000 square kilometers convert that to square miles so what I would be doing is 1 million 700,000 one, two, one, two, three. divide by 1.609 now don't complain here that there is a strange conversion unit here but no it's between the two systems the 1.609 has nothing to do with the metric system it's just getting to the American system so I divide that and I come up with an answer that is actually kind of listed somewhere here I thought it was well maybe not at all but in any case it's the wrong one because it's an area so I have to divide by that twice do that there we go 656 round it you can see it here 660,000 miles square miles all right therefore when you compare the two areas Germany I'm sorry Alaska has an area that is five times larger Germany's area is five times smaller KB Road between Solar and Kina are at some point two large thermometer displays opposite each other the west side of the road on the forest in front of vet's office the other on the east side almost in front of Alaska Parma of Fish and Game the thermometer on the forest side usually shows a lower temperature and the other thermometer does this is a systematic error that is true you measure a car's tire pressure four times 31 32.5 32 33 psi it should be about 32 psi so you conclude that you measured fairly accurately and that this is a random or a small random error for this one here you would need to conversion equation between fahrenheit and um, celsius oh let's just do it so i'm gonna have the negative 20.2 times 1.8 and then I'm going to add 32 to that that's one way going from Celsius to Fahrenheit that's around at negative 4.4 and there's the right answer and that's the record for Berlin of course you can't really compare anything else in the world to to um, except Antarctica to the extreme t cold temperatures we could have in Alaska all right a sign on the highway says that an exit will come up in 2500 feet the sign could also say one half mile right because when I take 2500 and I divide it by the 5280 see so much nicer in the metric system where we just have 1000 in the American system 5280 I I figure that a number of people have that know that number but a number of people actually don't know that number I happen to know it because I'm teaching physics and it comes out to 0.473484848485 and so on and the rest here the bunch just doesn't make any sense so we just reduce it to 0.5 half a mile we're not even going to call it 0.47 
miles. You wouldn't see that on a highway sign. It would say half a mile. All right, two of these equations do not make sense. That is, the units do not fit. I already put them down here. The other four do make sense. There are actually three ways of, of writing this one down. Distance equals velocity times time. You drive 50 miles an hour for three hours, you make 150 miles. You drive a distance of 600 miles with an average speed of 60 miles per hour, you make it in 600 divided by, by 60 is 10 hours. You drive a distance of 200 miles in two hours and you have an average speed of 100 miles per hour and you get some big tickets. The last one here, by the way, is just a rewriting of the first one. Notice it doesn't matter if you multiply velocity times time or the other way around. And then if you look at these here, they wouldn't make any sense if you tried to plug in numbers. You would come up with something really screwy as well as the units would be really screwy. All right, I guess I am going a little quicker here, and here's something really, really, really quickly. As I said earlier, when I teach, I actually do convert between the metric system and the American system quite often because people are more familiar with the American one. And if I want to do it really, really quickly between meters and feet, I'm going to go, I'm going to take a walk for 100 meters. I'm not going to use these more accurate one. Yeah, this one here is nicely accurate, and this one is quite accurate as well. But I'm going to do something really quick. So I'm going to say, hey, it's 300 meters. Or I'm going to say, hey, I'm lifting something that is 150 kilograms. Well, I'm going to come up with 200, I'm sorry, 150 kilograms, 300 pounds. I'm going to do it really, really quickly. By the way, I'm confusing here mass with, with weight, which is not great. Um, but unfortunately, we do it in both systems, at least in everyday language. And in physics, we're going to really pay attention to distinguishing it between mass and and weight and force. All right, scientific notation. On this one here, I'm giving you a break because we are not using scientific notation a whole lot. Very, very little. Just like what I said about vectors. It just, this is almost the only time that we come across it. So here, write in scientific notation and round to three significant figures. As I said, significant figures we use all the time in this particular exercise. I combined both of them. So when you write this to scientific notation, you take the decimal point eight times over until you have it right behind a two. But then I'm also asking you to round it to three sig fig. So you look at the fourth one here, which will round up, and that's where you come up with a correct answer of the speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then here you do something similar with the gravitational constant, except you go the opposite direction, so you shift it over 11 times, and to indicate that this is a really tiny number, we put a negative in front of the exponent. And then, again, significant figure is 6.67, because I asked to round it to three sig fig. Notice on, so I'm gonna choose, let's see which one here, this one here. Um, notice on the next one here, there are exactly 60 seconds, exactly 60 minutes in an hour, exactly 24 hours in a day, exactly 60 seconds in a minute, and around 365.24 days. And then this footnote here, I explained what that exactly means. Please read through it so I don't have to read it out loud here. Compute the number of seconds in a year using correct significant figures and scientific notation. So the significant figures would get, therefore go with the least amount, which is 364, 5.24. As I explained in this footnote here, the 60 is an exact number, so it either doesn't participate or consider it to be infinitely many sig fig because of the word exactly. There is not about 60 seconds a minute. No, there are exactly there. So it's five significant figures. So let's see, it must be this one answer here, 3.1557, 10 to the seven seconds. Right in scientific notation, if you count, you come up with 24 times as you get that there. So the answer is H. And the last one here, if you count that, you have to shift it 19 times over. So it's this answer here. And is it three sig fig? Oh yeah, it did say three sig fig. So it's that answer. There we go. All right, next one, I'm just gonna give away vectors maybe edit graphically by placing them tail to tip. You might find a couple of examples in the book and we we'll have, we have a lab on the force table where you might see that. But as I said, I give you a break with vectors. We do very little with it. 
An archer shoots an arrow with a speed of 49 meters per second at a target 21 meters away. Two significant figures. It takes the arrow, well, 21 divided by 49. Oops. 49 comes out to 0 0.428571428 seconds total overkill totally senseless to draw that all out and write it down write down two significant figures that's the rule 0 0.43 seconds there it is airplane flies at 100 kilometers per hour notice that looks like one significant figure it doesn't say exact it doesn't say about either but in this kind of context we kind of assume that's actually one sig fig if if it flies into a head it flies into a 10 kilometer per hour headwind its speed relative to the ground its ground speed is 100 minus 10 90 kilometers per hour two men measurements necessary for calculating average speed are distance and time find that in the book on an object near the Earth's surface is in free fall its velocity increases and just drop something and you will say that yes it does increase the velocity yeah somebody could also argue it its acceleration increases because it's getting closer to the Earth well that's true if you look in chapter 9 uh, which is the one on gravitation you will actually see that the acceleration due to gravity does depend on how far you are from Earth but the distance is so small where the difference is so small for the acceleration that the acceleration kind of like increases in like the fifth decimal or something like that while the velocity increases instantaneously you know it goes from 9.8 to 19.6 to um, 29.4 meters per second within just a couple three seconds by the way our book allows us to use 9.8 or 10 for gravity and I allow you to do that as well 12 seconds after starting from us, an object freely, falling freely will have a speed of more than 100 meters per second. Downward is the correct answer. 12 times 9.8 comes out to roughly 118 or 117.6, I believe. But again, our book actually allows us to use 10. And so it does go down by a little by actually 120 and so the correct answer is more than 100 meters per second let me actually go back to this one here while an object near the earth's surface in free fall its velocity increases. oh yeah oh the word free fall so free fall means that air resistance is turned off as if there was no air as if we're in a vacuum that's not just something that we do whimsically saying oh because we want to no the reason we do that is to make the math easy so that we have simple equations to work with the d equals one half at squared that you find a book looks complicated but look up an equation for air resistance to be taken account of and you will see that oh wow that is way more complicated i'm happy that we have that d equals one half at squared all right so car increases velocity from 60 kilometers an hour in 10 seconds its acceleration oh from zero to 60 kilometers per hour in 10 seconds its acceleration is one significant figure 60 divided by 10 six kilometers per hour per second right here one significant figure again right here i put a gap i don't need to put that gap there however i want to emphasize that an acceleration is a change in velocity over time and so you will see that kilometers per hour per second our book actually sometimes lists meters per second per second which we then abbreviate to meters per second squared it's just that i'm just going to write it here once or twice like that to point that out it's the change of velocity over time that's the acceleration a boss a boss a boss tust a ball tossed vertically upward rises reaches its highest point and then falls back to its starting point during this time the acceleration to gravity of the ball is always directed downward and air resistance is always opposite its velocity in this case air resistance is turned on and also we don't have to calculate anything here and and so that's when we are using air resistance for the conceptual questions sometimes some conceptual questions we turn it off depends um, I think on the next one we actually do and for but for calculations we almost always turn air resistance off because it makes calculations much easier with the simpler equation and again also in the book yes 
we are using 9.8, but we can also alternatively look 10, use 10, and I allow students to do that as well. If you drop an object, it will accelerate downward at a rate of acceleration negative g, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, in the absence of air resistance. If you instead throw it upward, the acceleration is, as soon as it leaves your hand, will be, also in the absence of air resistance, well, the same thing. Because that's what is slowing it down, so you're throwing it upwards. Well, it is slowing down, well, due to gravity, of course, which is pointing downward. That's what I believe the last one here said. Yeah, the um, in this case here, the air resistance is always downward. During this time, vertically upward rises, oh, and then falls back to its starting point. So the, the, the acceleration due to gravity is always directed downward, which means on the way up, gravity is also opposite of its velocity. On the way down, it's actually with the velocity. The air resistance is always opposite of velocity. On the way up, air resistance is downward, slowing it down. On the way down, for the ball to fall down, the air resistance is pushing upward, again slowing it down. So that's what that one means as well. All right, this one here looks like two significant figures. Figures: A car accelerates at 2 meters per second squared, assuming the car starts from rest. How much time does it need to accelerate to a speed of 30 meters per second? So 30 divided by 2 is 15 seconds. When a rock thrown straight upward gets to the exact top of its path, its velocity is zero and acceleration is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared. This is some people could call it a trick question. I don't think it really is. When a rock thrown straight upward gets the exact top of its path, yes, it stops, because now it's turning around, but its acceleration is still there. It's not zero. If its acceleration was zero, then it would just hover up there, which obviously it's not. And gravity doesn't miraculously turn off just because an object stopped. Gravity is near the Earth's surface, always 9.8 meters per second squared downward. All right, on this one here, the mass velocity of a bullet fired from the, a rifle is 100 meters per second. Neglecting air resistance at the end of one second, a bullet fired straight across will have traveled a horizontal distance of 100 meters, 100 times 1. But when you fire it straight up, it will have traveled a vertical distance of, well, 95.1 meters. Because just shooting it straight upwards is this one here. 100 times 1 is 100 meters, but at the same time, gravity is trying to pull it down, so at the same time, it is 1 half times negative 9.8 times 1 squared, which is negative 4.9, whoops, negative 4.9, and therefore that one has to be subtracted from 100, and that's why it doesn't go as high, because gravity is immediately trying to to um, not just slow it down, but um, reduces the, the um, theoretical height that it could go to. A car maintains a constant velocity, 100 kilometers per hour, for a time of 10 seconds. During this interval, its acceleration is, well, it doesn't accelerate. It has a constant velocity. That's what it says right here. Constant velocity, therefore the acceleration is zero. Heavy object and light object are dropped at the same time from rest and vacuum. The heavier object reaches the ground at the same time as the lighter object if it is in a vacuum. I do an experiment in class where I take a small book that I know when I drop it, I'm not going to ruin the book. So I'm going to take a small book and it's heavy enough that it doesn't feel much air resistance. And then I take a little piece of paper. So I, so I take a big piece of paper and just rip off a little bit of corner. And then I drop them, one in my left, one in my right hand. And obviously the book falls much faster to to the um, to, to the ground as, as the air is, as, as, as the little piece of paper does because the air resistance has a much smaller effect on the heavy book than it does on that yeah large surface area very small weight paper piece then i repeat the experiment this time around i take the piece of paper and, and carefully place it on top of the flat book and now i drop the flat book with the piece of paper on it and you will see that the piece of paper falls just as fast as the book does simply because the book takes away the air resistance from it so, therefore, I cannot can simulate vacuum in the classroom. I'm not evacuating the classroom with, with air because then I guess we would all die. 
At one instant, an object in freefall is moving downward at a velocity of negative 50 meters per second. One second later, its speed should be about, well, negative 60 meters per second. Again, our book allows us to use that 10 instead of the 9.8. So as something is falling down 50 meters per second, 60 meters per second, 70 meters per second, and so on, if we round that 9.8 to a nice 10, because we in, in midair we can handle that a little better. All right, and that was the recording for the practice test. I know that was very long, but it's the first one, and I wanted to be thorough, and I wanted to do, make a lecture out of it. I didn't cover, in this case, the computation problems at the end, because those are actually in other in another recording where you come across them and where I actually do the algebra. And you will also find them in what I call the WAPIP, the worked out problems in physics. That's that 90 page document that I ask you to print out, which you will use for the homework and for the practice test and to study for the proctored or non-proctored exams. So the practice tests are only about these multiple choice questions.